also because we have a lot to talk about. Um, and we are hoping to have an amazing hour of a conversation around literacy, mentorship, and um, how they all go hand in hand. Um, so before we start um, the actual presentation, we just want to thank you again for joining us and welcome you to our Urban Collaborative Collab Talk. My name is Ruchika Chopra, and I work with the Urban Collaborative, along with my colleagues Lauren Katzman and Catherine Benedict, who are joining us here from Phoenix, Arizona. I am joining you here from New York, uh, Brooklyn, New York. Um, today, we will be facilitating this collab talk. We will keep an eye out for questions that you may have for our presenters and answer any Urban Collaborative relate related questions. So please, as you are listening to them, Write your questions, thoughts, ponderings, show your appreciation of what may have been shared, or let us know if you are having similar issues and or have implemented some solutions that are working for you and your students in your district. And if you're here from a, a company, let us know if there's a solution that you're working on that uh, you're sharing with other districts. Let me remind you that we are recording this session and we'll have it available for you or your colleagues to review after today. So just let us know if you need us to send it to a colleague who may not have been able to join. Before we start with our presenters today, just wanted to share some reminders and urban collaborative related questions and information. Our Collabcast podcast this month was with Dr. Karen Grace from Cambridge Public Schools. Dr. Grace shared her experiences and knowledge on developing literacy practices for all children so that all can achieve the goal of reading. We encourage you to take a listen. Information for that collab cast and our upcoming events can be found on our Instagram page, Urban Collaborative ASU, and you just click on the uh, link in the bio. And we are very excited to let you know who will be joining us next um, in our collab cast and in the collab talk next month. Um, Dwayne, if you want to move to the next slide. We have in December, we'll have a collab talk with Dr. Goldie Mohammed. And in December, we will also be sharing a collab cast, which is our podcast with Dr. Alfredo Artiles. So we look forward to you joining us for the collab talk and listening in on uh, Dr. Attilas in December. Today, we welcome Christian Ada from the Fayette County School District in Kentucky and Dwayne Millard from Scholastic to share their experiences and engage with us in a conversation around mentorship and how it can be used to develop family and community partnerships, as well as how literacy and books can be used to empower students, families, and volunteers. Duane, can you please introduce yourself and Christian? And thank you once again for leading this conversation with us. Sure, we're happy to be a part of the Urban Collaborative Experience. Thanks for inviting us. Um, just quick introduction, Christian, I'll allow you to introduce yourself. For those that I haven't met before in the chat, uh, my name is Duane Millard. I am the Senior Vice President of Scholastic Education Solutions Partnerships. And Christian? And my name is Christian Adair, I'm a former uh, employee of Fayette County Public Schools. I am now the executive director at the Lyric Theater and Cultural Arts Center. And I also um, am a consultant when it comes to mentoring and community engagement. And I'm excited to be here and share um, my experiences. And so Christian, we've been, Christian and Edwin, I just want to say, we've been trying to get this together for so long. Uh, and to have you all share this information with our district members that Christian was working at that time with Fayette and mm -hmm. now he's not. But thank you again for joining us. Yes. And I would say now he's not directly. He's probably a mentor rather than running mentorship. And that's the conversation we wanted to have with you. So the conversation today, and please, in the chat, if you have any questions, any comments, share with us, make it as interactive as possible. But the conversation is really about family and community engagement, just high level. Scholastic is family and community engagement. That is one of our portfolios and our partnership is broad. Christian is one of our partners 
And he's been a significant help in making sure that we can have an impactful mentorship program for our schools and our community partners. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, but we're also going to talk about some data behind it, some findings and some stories and some implementation models. And again, give us any questions or any feedback you have. Okay. So um, starting, I want to have context. So if you take a look at what's in front of you, when you think about research and you think about hours awake and you think about the challenges of our schools, our schools are tasked to accomplish so much. But when you think about how many hours, how many awake hours our children have, of the 6,000, only 1,000 of those hours are spent in schools. The opportunity is figuring out how can we get as much as possible out of the 5,000 hours that kids are not in school. And so that's one of the ways that we know that we need to move the needle. So I'm just going with some context and some basics. So when we talked about mentorship, and actually when I first came back to Scholastic and Christian and I met, and we talked about this mentorship program that we had and how could we innovate further, one of the key things we had to do is think through the lens of not features, advantages, and benefits when you think about programs but it's really about what are we solving to and what are we solving to which ties back to all of our human goal of getting as high as we can in Maslow's hierarchy when you think about self-actualization and what we try to do for our children. So when Christian and I first started talking and he challenged me to say, okay, where are we innovating? I went back to our product development team and our research and our co-design team and I put in front of them to think through this through Maslow's hierarchy. And so Christian, this is where I wanna get your reaction because when we went back and we said, what are we solving to? And who are we solving for? This is how we look through the lens of what mentorship can do when you think about partnerships with schools and communities. So if you look here, here are the connections to what are we actually solving to that matters to our mentors, matters to our children, matters to our teachers, matters to our building leaders. And I do have one that's not showing right now, which is matters to our families. Christian, any reaction any reaction to any of these parts, your thoughts? Well, you know, when I, when I first started this program and, and working with you, I was thinking it was all about the students and all about the kids. And as we went along, we've ended up finding out how it started empowering the mentors themselves and how they wanted to connect and bring more to the schools and felt more uh, welcome, uh, felt more value. And when the whole community is starting to feel value, then that created an atmosphere here is that everybody was in this to help our students and help our schools. And so I heard a lot of stories and the more stories I heard, I was like, well, the students are happy, they're enjoying it, they're looking for it. But when the mentors walked away, I had one tell me he, was a, he felt like a superstar. And then several were wanting to know what more can they also do? So all these, and this is the first time I saw this, um, the way you had this out here, is that everyone wins when we bring mentoring around literacy. And I didn't see that coming. That was not even a thought in my mind. Totally agree with you. And we took that into consideration because we knew how important it was to the success that you wanted us to continue to have. And so we went back to, development and we develop through this lens. And I just wanna give you a context of what we mean by mentorship. What we mean by mentorship is we mean, how can we use mentorship through literacy? And through literacy, have mentors come into a classroom and, and be the lead for interactive read alouds. So it's not just someone coming into a school to read a book. It's someone coming into a school to develop a relationship with the kids, develop a relationship with the teachers, and actually understand and, and see the agency that the community and the families have in being a part owner of the school and the school's success. But it's all about that relationship. And so when you think about that relationship, and Christian, you see this picture. So this is from New York City, one of the mentorship programs that we have. And that's a beautiful grandma engaged in conversations with kids. And when she's engaged with, in those conversations with kids, She's thinking about social emotional. She's actually doing reading with background knowledge building and building communities of learners. She's actually during the reading, engaging in higher level, higher order thinking, text dependent questions, vocabulary development. You see everything that's happening when she's doing this read aloud, but she's doing this read aloud because we're scaffolding it and she's doing it naturally. She's not 
replacing or trying to be a teacher. It actually happens naturally. And the great thing about it is New York City saw the connection to science of reading because of the way it's building background, but from a community perspective, trying to actually bring the community into the problems that we're trying to solve. Christian, when you see that picture, what resonates in your background and experience before we get into actually everything that you do? Well, when when the mentor came, they didn't just come and read. They brought themselves. They brought the community into the school. We connected the seven hours in the school with the 17 hours in the community. And this grandmother here, for instance, brought her real life experiences. And a lot of times kids connect to that. And because of that, and you can see their kids, they're, they're staring, they're, they're intent in listening and listening and what she wants to share. They just love the fact that she's there and that not just the teacher cares, but other people in the community care. And uh, I will talk about this later, probably, but this is love. Anytime is. you share your education and you read and you're sharing your personal stories, you're showing love. And that's the highest form is, is, is this. So this looks nothing but love to me right here. Nothing but love. I totally agree with you 110%. And so continuing this conversation, I wanted to connect on love and connect on relationships and connect, connect on that conversation. So if you look at data, when you think about how our kids in school feeling in relation to actually having someone to talk to, look at this data right here. This is a part of how we're solving to the whole child by looking at this kind of data, because the, these are pre-academic data. These are the leading indicators of what are our kids coming into class needing solutions to for themselves, for a sense of belonging, for feeling like a part of a community. And these are the kind of data that we're getting back in elementary and in high school. And when you look at it on another level and you look across subgroups, I want you to look at this data when you think about chronic absenteeism. And when you think about what we went through in COVID and how it impacted different subgroups and look at the subgroups that you work with and look at the impact of chronic absenteeism and the increase that's happened. And by involving the community and by showing that importance of school and community, it's a way to actually work on how do we increase attendance. So I wanted to share some data points connected to the work that Christian does. And Christian, I'm going to pass it to you, but I just wanted people to see a little glimpse of what it looks like. So Christian, when you think of these tools that your mentors and your teachers and the districts are using, any stand out to you that you feel mo most uh, involved or most passionate about what it actually brings to the table? Well, we know, um, and our students also reflected this, is when you see yourself in the books and you see your culture in the books or you're familiar with the stories, you become more engaged in that books. So what I see now is than what I saw before is that now the, the books look like all of the students. And when kids have books at home that don't look like them, it's good. It's a cultural connection. When kids have books at home that look like themselves, it's a cultural connection. So when you guys expanded the types of books of kids in everyday life, not just Martin Luther King, and I always throw that out there, not just Rosa, not about right. coming out of, of, of poverty, but you have everyday ordinary students that look like them doing everyday ordinary things. So it stands out to me. Uh, I don't see the uh, the Spanish on this one where, where it's now in English and Spanish, but Thank you when you that. guys is it, coming up. Okay. No, it's, it's not coming up in the slide, but it does exist. So keep going. Okay. Sorry. So we, when I found out that these these first, second, third, fourth graders were taking these books home and reading it to their parents who are EL learners, second language, you know, they didn't understand English, but they're learning how to read and understand English better by reading with their kids out loud. It was something else that I did not see coming. And because of that, the families felt more engaged. They weren't disconnected from schools. And then when you guys turn the the, the uh, family guides into English and Spanish, it connects more community. And, you know, the more connected, the the better. So I love that the way it's going is it's 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 expanding the cultural connections. Beautiful, beautiful. So now I want I want uh, the audience to see what it looks like. So I, I'm a visual person. So I'm going to quickly share a video of Christian with mentors in a school in Fayette County Public Schools when when that's where what your role was specific. So let's take a look. See, so y'all like to read? I, I love books. Oh, I do too. I love to read. 
This is the best part. You ready? The Scholastic Real Program is a program designated to bring readers in to read to our students. Real Read Program has strengthened our district because now at all 36 of our elementary schools, every student that goes there have home libraries. The books are dynamic. They are reflective of our rich tapestry of people. So when the kids open up a book, they see themselves in it. Anybody have any questions? Anybody want to tell me how this story makes them feel? We know that reading is one of those fundamental skills that is the foundation for everything that you do. I was going to tell people it's the highlight of my day, oftentimes a week, sometimes even month. That's my experience with Scholastic is just to see everybody playing a part. And I really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. So Christian, tell us a little bit about that experience because that was an amazing day. And before you go, these pictures that I'm sharing with you now are from other places in the States where we had beautiful families coming in to actually participate in these interactive read alouds. But Christian, tell us a little bit about the people in that video and just take us back to that moment. Well, well what we found here in Fayette County, we had lots of volunteers, right? Uh, most of them were women, and 82% of our teachers were, were white female. And so when we looked at, you know, who can we engage? Who, who do we want to bring into the schools to bring their culture and their experiences? We ended up calling it Real Men Read. And when we called it Real Men Read, we had over 500 new volunteers, 150 of them being men of color. And so that was a new dynamic. And so it brought a cultural influx and also, you know, just different lens uh, of into the schools. And we had all success stories, people, you know, the politicians coming in and, and reading. We had dads, we had stepdads coming in. We had people from the district who do not, who normally do not teach students to come into schools and read, to be reminded why they're there, why they're working. So this connected, through literacy, we connected everyone. Everyone could come there and share themselves. Um, and that was one of the most powerful pieces is that people volunteered that you normally wouldn't ask. They stepped up and they realized everyone had a place. Everybody belonged. The schools were prepared to accept. The schools knew people were going to come and read. And, and you know, even though the reading took uh, ten, five to ten minutes, these sessions lasted an hour because there's a lot more conversations about, well, what do you do? Do you got a cat? What do you do for a living? They would tell them, you know, what they do for a living from uh, dissecting uh, insects to working at the university, but we had so many, so many wide ranging uh, of jobs and, and people with their um, expertise coming in the building. It built on other things. So, uh, and Christian, I mean, when we're here and we're talking about Fed, like, what was your first mentoring experience, and what made you gravitate into this space? Well, I wish you had the picture of it because it was an amazing picture I caught. Um, so I, I was there, I was brought into the district. I, I'm, I create mentoring programs, right? And this one was around literacy. And so don't take, don't take this wrong. I wasn't that excited about doing something about reading, first of all. So I was like, okay, we're going to go in there. And I read to a class and, and I'm no expert at reading. And when I was done, the entire class came up and did a big group hug. Literally, they all were hugging me. And I wish I could show you guys a picture, but they were hugging me. And one of the kids reached up and he started scratching my beard like this. And I was looking down, I looked down at him. I said, you know, what are you doing? And he looks up to me, he says, um, I never touched a beard before. And so first of all, I'm like, okay, this is a, a second grader. He's never touched a beard before, but he took that chance, right? And I'm like, okay, I understood. This is my, not just about me reading. It was the fact that I was there. I showed that I cared. I realized that some of the students haven't had access or opportunity to be engaged with, with men in that, in that setting. And so that's when I, the, the idea, the spark about, you know, let's get more men into the schools and read. And when that happened, I had a job to do. And when, so then it started me on my journey. How do I get men to come in and read? Or how do I get volunteers to come and be many mentors? And one thing I found is that you have to ask. But you got to tell men in particular what you want from them and how you want it. So for them, it was like, you know, one hour a month for four months. I need you to come in, read this 10 minute book and share who you are, share your experiences. And when you gave men a job to do, it, it was so much easier. I was able to engage just about anyone, anywhere I went. And they were all like, hey, I can do that. And um, 
that that's my that's my intro experience to how powerful this become because over the next four years I realized how it people want to be involved and but at the same time you got you have to you have to show that you appreciate them and you have to give them a voice no question thank you for that and now I want to put it into context of a school Fayette County Public Schools by the way I do want to give a shout out Christian to Miranda Scully and Sharon Mosey Boswell. Oswald, yeah. I'm pronouncing the last name correctly. You did. Um, so they're keeping that work moving forward uh, as you partner with the district, but they're actually managing this program moving forward. And so this is what Fayette County Public Schools looks like, just so you can get an idea of the demographic and the size of the district. But more importantly, um, 14,000 students have received 56,000 books. It's the beginning of building home libraries so we can overcome uh, home, home library and, and, and book deserts. Um, 500 volunteers with 150 of them, them being men of color and 50 plus businesses and organizations involved. 100% of elementary school students with a home library. Christian, that's a proud moment. What resonates yeah. with you when you think about I, this? I brag on that all the time. You know, 100% of our kids have culturally responsive and inclusive library books, right? So it's not just books, it's culturally inclusive. They look like our students. All of them have libraries. They can all read it loud. We know when you read it out loud that you correct yourself. I had parents complaining about kids reading out loud at, at dinner time. I had, and that was a great story. I'm like, that's not bad. They said, yeah, but I have a fourth grader and a second grader reading out loud to each other at the same time. But <laughs> having that many men of color come in the district feeling like they belong, because historically we haven't felt very welcome. Uh, and now that they felt welcome, and then you get to the businesses and organizations, I created competitions. I was like, okay, this law firm has adopted this school. What about you? Or with with uh, different um, high school athletic programs, we're like, well, your football team is over here, but the, there's a volleyball team at that school. So people wanted to outdo each other. And in the firemen, of course, and the, uh, competing with the policemen, they wanted to compete. And so there was a healthy competition about what schools, well, we got this school over here, you got this school over here, of course, fraternities. Um, historically black fraternities, they wanted to outdo each other. And we had whole schools being adopted. And and they it was a point of bragging. And can't forget these politicians and their selfies. Uh, don't let them run for office. They're, they're in every classroom building doing their selfies and showing that they're putting in on uh, influencing the kids in positive ways. So it became a snowball effect. Um, and so, but, you know, increasing, and I think there's way more than 56,000 books now, of course. But mm -hmm. the fact that all students had access and opportunity. No and question. to me, that's that's the biggest thing that I wanted to make sure that all the students had these culturally responsive books in their hands. And the thing that I loved about what you said and what you're doing and what the district continues to do is, you know, the focus in education on college and career and how this can be a part of it because college career and exposure to different cultures and having different people from different walks of life, diverse walks of life coming into a classroom and kids being able to see where they come from, what their work life is like, what they're like as a human being, what is different about their culture. You told me one time that the universities had not just the basketball and football team, but the volleyball and the swim team, which brought different cultures into the classroom. Could you elaborate a little bit about what that does for the classroom and the school and the community? Of course. Um, so at the at University of Kentucky, which is a huge university here, the dive team and the swim team um, come to find out that a lot of their athletes were from Scandinavian countries and spoke different languages. And so they brought that culture in from a whole new from a whole different country. And they wasn't used to coming in schools the same way either. So they shared what their schools were like, where they're from. And again, they brought the language in. And, and language usually is a is a point of culture, right? And that shows their culture. But these things we did not, I'm always talking about what we did not anticipate and what came out was now we had different teams at the university from around the country, because the most university students are from everywhere else, bringing in what it was like where they're at in their school in Oklahoma or California or New York. And it was a cultural exchange every time they came in to read. And, and I want to answer some of these questions down here um, about the mentors doing the read alouds. All the mentors would read aloud. And that was one to ask. And yes, they were nervous. I have friends and family and, and fraternity brothers and all. 
that were doctors, lawyers, engineers. They're like, I, I, I can't be reading in front of these kids. What if I mess up? They're going to make fun of me. They were highly educated people that were nervous about it. But with the mentor guide that, that were given, which helped calm them down, was like they could read that mentor guide before they went in. So they were prepared to ask questions or to answer questions about the book. It made them all a lot more comfortable. And it was like, OK, that five minute read wasn't so bad because they were nervous. They really were. They told me. Uh, but reading it aloud. Um, and Christian, just to piggyback on what you said, when I was actually there with you one day, the guy who's in the video, the tall guy, the book that he had to read was on yeah. dinosaurs. Yeah. And he had to read a bunch of dinosaur names that were like, you know, seemed like eight syllable names. And he was worried about reading it. And the word to him, and he was comfortable with it, was one of the things that you wanted the kids to see is see struggle and see struggling to get better. That's that's what you want kids to lean into. And feel free to elaborate because I thought that was a great moment. Well, uh, so you, I'm a storyteller, but one of those moments also with the, the young lady in red glasses on this picture told him dinosaurs went extinct a long, long time ago, like back in 2012. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> she said they were extinct like way back in 2012 they got extinct so um yeah when well, he was struggling with the words and the kids he said can you help me and mm -hmm. there you go you engage the kids the kids were trying to figure out the words and it made it that much more enjoyable again it's, it's not just about reading it's about sharing yourself showing that it is important but the kids knew that reading be, was important because People were there trying and they were showing that they're involved in it. So uh is again, it's not what you say, it's what you do. And he was present. And that yeah. that that's what mattered just as much as as everything. No question. And so I want to talk a little bit about um what does this mean from a data perspective? So I'm gonna move through this part for a second, Christian, and I can come back if you want me to, but what I want to make sure that everyone sees are and actually they're both results. So let's look at the outcomes and let's start here, Christian. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the outcomes from your perspective, and then I want to show some feedback outcome that that we also have in relation to the work that you and Fayette County have done. So we, we knew that there's qualitative and quantitative data, and you and we couldn't take all that qualitative data from the teachers actually teaching the you know reading. Uh, but what we did measure and what we did do surveys and did ask is that these were the outcomes. If you guys can see the screen, but we increased in all of these spaces. And by increasing all these spaces, we increased education and belonging and, and family and community engagement. And so um, when we got started, we didn't know where our data points were going to be. We knew that we wanted a mentor program around literacy. We wanted to mean something. We didn't realize all of these different outcomes that would possibly happen. And then as we went along, we know they were, to, to, they were true, you know. Uh, one of the ones I do want to point out is the positive behavior intervention supports. I pushed back against that for a long time. However, the fact be became that, hey, when students knew that their reader was coming, they did increase their positive behavior. And even though I would say teachers don't use that, don't move kids out of the room when it's time to read or, or use that as a, as a uh, I'm, I'm not going to let you be your, your reader. Well, we found that kids wanted to be in the classroom when the readers came. And because of that beha that that positive behavior, I had to give give back and say, okay, use it how you how you need to. But uh yeah. That's exactly it. And so Christian, looking at data a step further. So one thing we did through your facilitators is have them actually give us feedback from the families in relation to what kind of changes or what kind of impact were they seeing. And I have to make sure that I take a step back. Uh, uh, one of the New York City DOE face leaders uh, always makes sure that I remember this because, you know, reading and books going home is a part of the solution, but it really is about the language that that gives access to. And uh -huh. so you think about this language happening in the classroom and this language opportunity happening at home. This is how, when you think about pre-academic indicators, how we influencing and using those 5,000 hours outside of the school to our advantage. And so when you look at this data right here, the one that stands out to me the most, and you mentioned an example of it earlier, Christian, which was the percentage of increase that families saw of older siblings reading to younger siblings. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts around this data? Because this was amazing to see what kind of results you were getting. Any, any thoughts or what stands out to you or anything you wanna share? So, so we, we asked families, you know, what, what occurred 
so the question on seven hours to the 17 hours in the community, basically. When we extend educating and reading outside of the normal school day, so now we've extended and kids are learning all the time, right? And when we have a second grader being exposed to fourth grade reading levels because his brother wants to read out loud and vice versa, then it's all positive outcomes. We knew that the second grader was already exposed to fourth grade reading levels. So he's going to be better prepared or she's going to be better prepared when they get to that level. And the surveys here just show how the parents wrapped around and supported this program. But the outcomes were the outcomes. And uh, I don't know how deep you want me to, to go into it. But we really wanted to know, because this is a program we wanted to figure out, do we want to keep going with it? And we mm -hmm. had to have the community involved and we had to get their feedback. And so when we would have them come at the beginning year or the end of the year to have people come talk to the school board, like, what about Real Read? What did you like about Real? Is that something that you would do? And people lined up and was like, hey, I can come, I can come. I and we had families coming to these meetings to share just the simple fact of reading at home, how it was important that they had these books with them and what their kids were actually doing with the books. Appreciate that. Definitely appreciate that. And so, Christian, here is the volunteer pool. So one of the most, um, one of the things that we often hear is how do you get people to come and volunteer? Could you talk to that a little? And we, right here, we see the diversity of types of volunteers that you have, but how do you get volunteers to come? What are your thoughts in that regard? Well, um, so I, it's important that we show that we uh, value partners, first of all. You don't want to show up and just do an ask right away. You got to value them. You got to actually engage them and talk to them. Uh, you can't wait until the last minute to say, hey, will you come to this school and read? You got to kind of engage them already. Um what the way I went about it is first we we went after men because we knew there was a lack of, but then it was like, who do you know that I should know? And then we would go and we'd go have a simple conversation with them, say, can we come to uh one of your meetings? Can we come to uh one of your conferences? Can we can we speak to your your president, whatever? But we would go there and we'd actually have these conversations with them and say what the outcomes would be and what how easy it was to do it. When you tell them exactly what you want, when you want it again. Uh, hey, I just we just need you to come out one hour a month for for seven months to read. Uh, the first place we went to was uh, the the mayor's office and the civic engagement community, where they actually gave their employees two hours a week off, but I mean paid time to go and read to the schools. And so that snowball when people found out that hey, you can be given your you know while you go to work, you can still go and volunteer to read. But with, again, with the politicians, with the college students, we knew that college students needed something to build their resumes with. We say, hey, this is a resume builder showing that you're volunteering in the school districts. Um, again, and then we create the competitions, of course, between the law offices and and so forth. But this is a this is a small list, actually, of all the places that I actually went to, because you got to remember, I did this for about uh, five years of engaging different communities. And sometimes people was like, well, why haven't you came and talked to us yet? You know, the veterans was kind of like, why did you not come to us? You know, why did you leave us out? And when I went to the Veterans Commission, they're like, we're just, you know, we didn't know if this is something that we that you want us to come to. And they actually were offended. And I was like, well, it kind of took me some time to get around. It is. And it just goes to the goes to the nature of look, people want to support, people want to help. It's just about helping to give them access and see what that experience and experience it. And they'll keep coming back to the well because it makes them feel good to help their community from all walks of life. And to your point, Christian, because uh, I don't know if I ever told you this, but um, and you mentioned it, corporate social responsibility is big in corporations. Yeah. And, and they are all about giving back. And one of the main ways that they like to give back is through volunteerism. And they do give amount of hours a month and a year that someone can actually leave work and volunteer. And actually it's a small world because I was at a, corporate meeting and Toyota, uh, the people who are responsible for volunteerism, mention your name because they also are a funder and a partner in Fayette County Public Schools. So there are so many different places to get uh, volunteers. They want they want to give back. Feel free to add on. Yeah. Well, um, just like I guess you, you kind of said what I was getting ready to point out is that a lot of those already have initiatives to do it. They just didn't know how to do it. 
They they hadn't been given a job to do yet. And this was low hanging fruit to them. It was like, oh, this is a turnkey situation already. We made it easy for them to volunteer. We made it easy for them to choose a school. We made it easy for them to have the job to do to go in. And one of the big things again is that there are other things spinned off. There were other programs that came out of this as well. And more resources came to the district as well because we engaged them into the schools through literacy. And so I, want you, I want you to expand on that. Sorry about that, Christian, but I want you to expand on that because what we are seeing is through these powerful conversations that we're having is that, and you've been to a lot of these places with me, that a lot of our districts are leaning into this model, this interactive read aloud mentorship model. And one of the biggest things that they're seeing and they're focusing on is it's all about moving from events to habits. And by having this happen once a month, four to eight times over the year, you start to create a cadence, a habit development. And where you were just going is the fruits of some of the things that have come from mentorship that were the, it, they weren't intended, but they're beautiful uh, results. What kind of things are you seeing resonating from doing something like this that have added additional values to the schools and the communities? Well, we had additional mentoring programs developed. We had uh, reward systems created. We had, uh, again, more volunteers. They were groups. We had a group of men that didn't know each other at all who end up coming together and creating uh, the more men of integ uh, integrity group of men to say, what else can we do to provide resources to the school? And they were, you know, strangers that came together to create that. But, uh, you know, they, again, they felt like they belong, right? They felt like they were valued. They felt like they had a voice. And at the end of the day, when they would leave and say, you know, when they tell me, thank you, Christian, thanks for inviting us or, we're glad the school district is doing this. Is that they all wanted something to do that was more that was powerful, mm -hmm. and with this being so easy for them to join in and be a part of the puzzle that we're creating here, it made them want to do more. And and so now we have no we have no we can create a new program and have a plethora of people or a list of people to go to right now to say hey we're also doing this would you like to be a part of that, and they would. And so, again, 20 minutes a day of reading that an hour of your drive, your drive time, they all felt that they could do more. Agree. Agree. And if I could share one Christian, it's in Memphis, Tennessee, but it sticks with me because the mentors that come to work with uh, the kids in Memphis, Tennessee, they actually, as a community, put up, you know how, like when it's time to vote. So it's polit political season when they're putting the different lawn signs in the yard. They actually have lawn signs of the mentors. So okay. when they go to the grocery stores and things of that nature, they're like stars amongst the kids in the community, which again, just think about what that does in relation to a sense of belonging and empowerment with the people that are participating. The stories that you do and what we're seeing our districts do, they're really, really, really amazing. So Christian, one of the questions in the chat was asking, uh, is it face-to-face? -face? Is it virtual? What does this experience look like? So there's a combination now, you know, we started this before COVID hit and it was all face to face. It was like, we want that in-person feel and to see if you got a vest on because you work for the city and your sanitation. Well, we, when COVID hit, we were like, what can we do now? We end up creating our own YouTube channel and we asked the, the mentors to, to look out of a window to get that good light, videotape themselves on their phone and read the book. And when they did that, we ended up putting on our YouTube channel. We put it on our school. Uh, we have also have a, a TV station. We put it on there and we also made it into a podcast. So at this time, schools that were being that were all using Zoom and things like that at home, they were able to put the video up at on their on their actual Zoom channel. And they were actually able to turn the TV on or just listen to it in the car. So we called it anytime, anywhere, real read. And that is a combination. So we still have in in uh usually I show a link where you can go to today to our YouTube channel and see about 50 different uh, readings going on about from different people from all over reading for the kids to choose from anytime, anywhere. And so it, it's a combination of both. Love I, it. I just want to uh, 
Christian, I just want to add a um, uh, comment around there, around um, students with disabilities or just any anybody at the uh, at this point. I'm just thinking about how powerful it is that you have people from your community um, recorded in reading texts that they can then use as we used to call them books on tape. Now they're what uh, audio books. So whatever it might be, that it just opens up uh, more real and connected um, uh, language and, and accents and cultural connections that they can have when they're listening to those books. Um, and just to be thinking about it from that perspective, that, that that would be amazing that you've built this particular plethora of resources for teachers to be able to use. I also wanted to just, there was another question I wanted to ask, and I think um, this one's for you, Duane, about is it, um, are these different than Scholastic Rising Voices series? That's a great question. I'm going to answer that one and one other one. So I'm going to use Camden as an example in relation to what they've done. So for those that don't know what Rising Voices is, Rising Voices uh, are curated classroom collections that are all about bringing diversity into the classroom. Um, it started with how can we actually have our um, children of color see themselves as protagonists and in, use diff in different walks of life. The books that are in Rising Voices and the books that are in Real are accomplishing the same goal, but they're two different models. So what Camden does is they've integrated Rising Voices into the classroom and they're using the Real books for the mentors and the books going home. So they actually complement each other. And then there was another question, and I'm going to pitch this one to you, um, Christian, because we offer real pre-K-8, but what grades was Fayette County using it? And how do you feel about the older kids if you went, I can't remember how high you went in relation to grade levels. Well, we did strictly elementary here. Um, the, they were shorter and quicker reads. When we got to the um, fourth and fifth grade, the books were chapter books. Uh, or, or thicker books, and you couldn't finish a whole book in one reading. So we weren't quite sure how to do that. We had to end up, you know, let's let's go get you in there and get it started. And the kids would have to finish the book a lot of times. But our main focus was the elementary kids. We wanted to instill the love of reading. We wanted to, to focus on those, you know, by third grade, if you're not at reading level, you tend to struggle from that point forward. And you're not a self-learner if you're not reading by third grade. So we wanted to really focus in, and we even uh, use the books at preschools. You know, we don't we don't have a public preschool here. We have like only four of them out of uh, in our whole district. But we'd even get the kindergarten books being read to preschoolers, and we even got coaches to read at football practices. But we were wanting to focus in on those elementary students first and foremost. Um, and not that we felt that reading, of course, is not valuable at the secondary level. You know, six, seven, and eighth. But that was our focus. Yes, and, I, and and thank you for that. And so it's available pre-K to eight. Um, what I see a lot of districts focusing on is they're using this as a part of their third grade proficiency strategy. Actually in Kentucky, based on what you were doing with Real, uh, I think it's Senate Bill 9 is now asking for all districts in Kentucky to have a targeted intentional family and community engagement program that is focusing on literacy, just to show you that this connection to proficiency, third grade proficiency, but then the other piece, Christian, and you can expand on this because a lot of districts are looking at how can I have my fifth graders in elementary read to the primary grades? How can I, when travel is an, uh, an issue, how can I have my high school students come and read to elementary? Because you know, we talk about this all the time, uh, especially our black and brown boys, start to look at literacy as not for them. And the more that we can have them see older people that look like them and older students, as well as older adults appreciating literacy and how that can help to stop the loss of loving to read at a point in time in your life. But what is your what is your point? You're like, oh, speak upon it. Sorry about that. Well, we found, so we wanted our high schoolers it was twofold. So we have a, several mentoring programs in high school. Of course, we have athletics, but to put them in a box, right? We say, hey, you're going to be, you're going to go read to these elementary kids. That means that they're going to look up to you. 
you can't just go read them. You also have to be the character that we want you to be. You have to be a leader. And so to give some of these, these guys and, and these girl, and young ladies a way to be a leader and to give back, we had entire athletic team and mentoring programs adopt schools to go and read in the classroom. So now you got that, you know, boys like the cool pose and they act different when girls are around. But when they saw these young, these high school guys come in with their football jersey on or or the girls volleyball team come with their volleyball jersey, they say, oh, OK, it's cool. It's OK to be about your books and about reading. And it gave everyone, again, a job to do, a connectedness. Kids would come back and like my mentors, my mentees, when they would come back, they was like, hey, that was my teacher. And and they wanted the teacher to see how well they were doing. And, and then there's all loves and hugs. And then kids are looking at the kids. The, their teacher hugged this high school student, showing appreciation and love and, and smiling. It wasn't just, again, it wasn't just about reading the book. It was the relationships. And it gave those 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 high school, middle school students sometimes something to do when they were reading that was impactful, not just showing up and trying to figure something out. But what did happen, I always keep saying it, when one of the students, I'll give you an example, one of the students from the high school robotics team at Bryan Station went into a school. He was a part of, uh, they're doing Rubik's Cubes, Rubik's Cubes at that time. And so he had one with them. He was there reading and he started doing Rubik's Cube with the kids there. And now they want to do this whole Rubik's Cube program. <laughs> but that's around robotics, I guess, or some so it's not, but that's the spin-off. But because of literacy brought them all together. And I don't know if that's the question you're asking, but I'll say oh, it, it, it connects people in different ways that you don't predict. It, and it, it oh my fault. Continue. Sorry about that. That that that's my point. That was my point. Yeah, we're saying the same thing. It's 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 life changing. So yeah. thank you for that. So I'm gonna give you a challenge, Christian. I have six pictures. I want people to know exactly what those six pictures represent, but you can only uh -oh. give one minute because you have colorful stories. Uh -oh. pictures. So let's see where we go with this. But these are some beautiful pictures. And how okay. did we get let's go? Okay. Why well, I care about mentoring so much. The first picture there, that's my mentor. I went back and found his name is Dick Levins. He uh, was a schizophrenic. He dug a hole underneath his house to get away from the spirit voices He'd put earplugs in. He would call me pirate lady. But this guy gave me a penny a minute to work, gave me a dollar food stamp every Friday, told me school was important. Uh, the whole community, the world actually dismissed him. He was actually end up being a known genius. He helped build the hydrogen bomb. Uh, but he was at that time, he was schizophrenic and the community was done with him, but he was impactful. And because of him, I started 36 mentoring programs. The other picture was a picture I was talking about earlier that changed my views and thoughts about real read, about re the reading program, is this is a class that I read to. My first class I read to, they gave me the hug and love. If you look way in the back, you see the, the guy looking up at me. He's a black male. He's looking up. At, he's the one that touched my beard and actually changed, uh, he actually changed the trajectory in my life, really, because I became more focused in scholastics. And now I'm here talking to you guys because of, because of that little guy right there. Uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead, next picture. Uh, this is my mentor program, Alpha League. Uh, the guys that would go read. Um, this was my passion. This is how I even got into mentoring and then turn it in. And my superintendent, uh, he said, you're doing a great job with mentoring, Christian, but what are you doing with the educational piece? You know, what you got to tie this to some literacy, man. You get, our boys aren't reading. They're not doing math at eighth grade level and so forth. And it was his idea to say, let's let's expand this program that you're doing, but let's 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 get some reading in there. So but all these guys are my mentees who who whose job is to read with kids. Uh, here we got a pro athlete up in the corner with the white hoodie on. Um, that's my superintendent, uh, Mandy Cook, down the left corner that's holding the book up. He has the chain around his neck. Uh, and that's the super, that's the chair of the board, the, the white guy that's um, shaking hands. He's the school board chair. And so I would, I asked him, I say, well, I wonder who the school first first person on the board that's going to tell us to, to not spend money on getting kids uh, books to take home. <laughs> and he's going to be like, uh-oh. And then, uh, of course, up, up top is a politician, James Brown. He's reading. And, of course, he wanted me to take pictures so he can send out to all the people that's going to vote for him to show that he's involved in the school system as well. I'm telling on all these guys. You have to use what you got to get what you want. And here we go. Um, again, you know, so we have a, a couple of dads in here. Um, the redhead guy down here in the corner just married his wife and uh, trying to understand her world. And, you know, he's not been in school for a long time, but 
now he's there and he said he's made him he, he appreciates his wife's work a lot more and he goes there and volunteers all kinds of ways he felt valued there and um up there uh the guy in the alpha alpha shirt on he's reading at a park when we when we would go recruit volunteers or to tell people what we're doing we would actually go do it in the parks at different events uh different gatherings and say this is what it looks like you just grab this book and you read with the kids and so we want to show that out in the community outside the school walls so we don't want to be walls with barriers um the guys in the purple shirt down here are my mentees reading in small group so some of the classes were were big group were big classes and some of them were like hey let's be more focused and intentional and matching up these young males in particular was males that they maybe identify culturally with. And so we would do small group sessions as well where they're reading. And, and so um, not to say behavior is the, the starting point of that, but sometimes these kids need just a little bit more love and attention. And we give it to them through these, through these high schoolers. I'm going to keep going, Christian, but I just want to connect a lot of people who have tutors come into the buildings actually think about using this as a part of the tutoring program when you think about shared reading and the interactive read. Continuing. Okay, here we got, um, of course, police officers who compete, right? Oh, I spoke uh, I spoke to this group of police officers right here, and this is a picture there, and um, one of the most intimidating audiences I've ever was in front of. And before I left, I took a deep breath and told them, I was like, you guys ain't so bad. You guys you guys are probably scared to read with the kids anyway, but I thought I'd let you know. But uh, the police department and the fire department got in a big competition on what schools they were volunteering at and where they were um, reading at. So it became a healthy competition because they compete in every other way. Um, the African-American females here is a sorority. They come from the University of Kentucky. They wanted to get an idea. So we had an event at the beginning of the year to say, this is what it looks like. This is how, these are the books that you would read. And it's almost like a training, but really we were just kind of showing them appreciation. We give them t-shirts that they can wear. Uh, the top picture is a gentleman. They want, they were state, I think they were state baseball champions. Um, and so that was a big deal that they came to the school in their uniform to read with the kids. They had the whole team adopted the school. And then of course, I thought I was the only one getting hugs. And this, this mom sent me this picture and said, you're not the only one. And so it sent me the picture of this guy getting hugs from the kids. So it wasn't just me. It was a lot of people getting that love and attention. I love it. And Christian, you made it. I have to skip because of time. You did it timely, but it was beautiful and colorful. I want to give a public service announcement. And then you can also tell us what you think of you've seen the data that we have. So if of interest, at the end, I'm going to give you two QR codes as well as email addresses if you have any questions for follow up. But we have two research studies out. One of them is on the, uh, the power of power of home libraries. And one of the research studies, which you see the data here, talking about the number of books and what kind of an impact you see. But I'm going to tell you the most important data point to me is that families who have books at home and are engaged with books at home in relation to that language development is an equalizer when you compare a college-educated family to a non-college-educated family. That's how we close the gap. Well, that's one way that we can close the gap. So I just want to stress that point. And what you're doing, uh, Christian, in relation to helping to build home libraries and helping helping to build that passion and love for learning and reading is exactly how we close this gap. And so I am going to skip and get to showing a QR code as well as giving the email addresses if you have any questions for Christian or for Scholastic. First, on the left, that QR code can give you additional information in relation to the mentorship program that we've talked about. And if you are with a community-based organization or school district and you want to help in supporting building home libraries, that QR code is specifically for that specific interest and in giving the deepest discount on books to make sure that we can get kids high-quality books at home if those books are going home. And so lastly, here is Christian's email address if you need to follow up with him. My email address is showing, but I'm also giving the email address of two partners in the company that focus on family and community engagement in case you have any additional questions. And then are there any other questions in the chat that we could answer before we close? Look pretty good. Ruchika, if you're talking, we can't hear you. I am talking and I am appreciating um, 
for all who don't know, my my uh, mic was, isn't working. But I, I do want to say, Dwayne and Christian, there are people in the chat who are appreciating um, many of the things that you've talked about. Um, somebody's appreciating the YouTube ch channel. Somebody's appreciating the webinar in general, the uh, the conversation today um, in general, and we also want to lend our thank yous in that. Just for everybody to know, when we do post this, we will also share um, those the QR codes. So we'll pull that out and we'll share them as well as the email addresses so that you have that for, um, for being in touch with both Christian and Wayne um, and to be able to get this work started in your school districts um, and again, let us know if there's something around this work that you are already doing. Feel free to send us as, as an email at uh, the Urban Collaborative um, at asu.edu. And um, we would love to highlight some of the work that you might be doing with mentors, with literacy, um, or uh, just in, in this space in general. Thank you. And thank you to the great work of the Urban Collab. Again, I've told you guys a million times. You're my favorite conference and my favorite people. You guys do great work and thank you for inviting us to this. Appreciate it as well. Thank you guys for allowing me to share the story. Again, It's I think there's a lot more stories to be had. We just got to give people the opportunity. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.